turning the volume up a little bit. How did your music career get started? Well, if I tell you how my music career got started, I'm going to have to go all the way back to when I was five years old, beating on my aunt's pots and pans in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, but uh, leading up to that, I got a chance at, in 1965 to play with a group called the Ink Spots. Now, some of you younger people may not know who they are, but they were the very famous R&B uh, soul um, old school music type group doing social music, okay? And I got a chance to play with them. Uh, what happened is a couple of guys, they knew that I was able to play drums at 15. So they decided, hey, you know, Will, come on, you can go with us. So they just took me under their wings and let me go. I wasn't their permanent drummer, but they took me under their wings so I could learn the ropes. So I got a chance to play drums for them, and uh, I got so proficient in it till they decided they wanted to keep me. But the problem was there was that I was in school, and my mom said, nope, <laughs> nope. So what they did, they said, okay, what we'll do, we'll do a situation with you like this. You could play, but you can only play in the summer. So that was good. So I learned, I played from 1965 to 1969 with them. And so during that time, I learned a lot about what happens on the road with groups. And so that's how my professional career started. What is your inspiration for making music? Uh, my inspiration for making music was that I used to listen to Otis Redding, uh, Joe Tech, um, Jackie Wilson, I listened to a lot of old school groups and uh, they inspired me to want to do the same thing because I, I would see them on TV at different times and I would see them in different clubs even though I wasn't old enough to go in some of the clubs. But I would go in there, I would sneak in and get a chance to look at some of these artists and see them perform and I was just amazed at how they would do it. And, and how they just captivated the audience. So what I did, I began to uh, emphasize, hey, wait a minute, let me do this. I can do this. But one, another thing that inspired me was the fact that I began to do research and I found out that it was no African-American record labels that was major other than Motown and Solar Records, which uh, Motown was Barry Gordy and sold our records was Dick Griffey. And I said, wait a minute, I'm gonna start me a record label. Now listen at me, I'm 19 years old talking about starting a record label. Well, what happened is, I can tell you what happened with that. In 1969, we put out a song called Raw Soul Express. Now, putting out that song, Raw Soul Express, we didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about a record label. So, I, but I did know this. That's what I wanted to do. So we went to Criteria Records in Miami, and I think a lot of people know about Criteria Records. And uh, it's now called Hit Factory, but it used to be, back in the days, it was called Criteria. And uh, we went and we recorded this song, but the song, we had no experience on uh, doing professional recordings or anything. But we did it, we tried it. I, the group that I was in, we put it together, we, we went on and, and we did it. And what happened is, well, hey, we lost money. In 1972, we was offered a record deal. We got very popular. We managed to play shows with some, uh, it, pretty much every group that you could name during that time, you know. So we played with James Brown, Glass Night and Phillips, Al Green, uh, you know, I mean, so many different groups, okay? Till, till I decided, I said, well, wait a minute you know, let's go head on and go a little bit farther. I decided to get married. <laughs> but, but one thing, the marriage was a blessing because when I got married, the woman that I married, she actually had a master's degree in business and a BS in accounting. So that taught me how to begin to save money. But it also did something else 
because by her having a master's degree in business, she became my manager. And she began to manage the group. And the group got so popular till we had so many jobs coming that we established a booking agency. And we hired a lot of bands to play in our place because we couldn't fulfill all the jobs. So it was like, I mean, we just, we, hey, all I can say is God opened the doors for us and we got very, very popular. We got married in 1979 and we started our business on the kitchen table. That's, that's where we started our business at. 1980 though, we had moved into an office and a studio and everything. And we moved from Liberty City, and the reason we moved from Liberty City because a lot of the artists that we were dealing with, they wouldn't come to Liberty City. And a lot of the artists that we're dealing with, their management didn't want them coming to Liberty City. So because they wouldn't come to Liberty City, what we ended up doing, we moved to Biscayne Boulevard. Well, we got to Biscayne Boulevard and we started getting bigger and bigger. Well, we end up having to move from Biscayne Boulevard, and we moved to downtown Miami. Then uh, another situation happened with me, which was very good, which uh, in 1985, when I won a Grammy with B.B. King. And I'm gonna give you the story of how that happened. And it was Luther Dixon and Dave Crawford. These were the two producers, and they were producing music for B.B. King, which I didn't know, but they came to my studio, which was in Miami, and they said, we'll, uh, we want to use your studio because we all in the music business and everything, we were friends. So I said, okay, right, what the heck is mine? I don't, you don't have to pay me, you know? They said, yeah, but we're gonna pay you. I said, well, when you gonna pay me? They said, well, I don't know, cause I ain't got no money. I said, well, man, just go ahead on back there in the studio and record. So they went back in the back and I don't know what they did because I didn't go back there. I let them go ahead on and do whatever they wanted to do. Well, when they got ready to leave, they came up to the front and they said, we'll, uh, we will pay you. I said, okay, all right, whenever. You know, I just brushed it off. Well, two years later, they came back. Surprising to me, they came back and said, well, we came to pay you. So I said, okay, where the money at? They said, well, we ain't got no money. I said, well, how are you gonna pay me? They said, well, this is how we are gonna pay you. B.B. Kings is at this, another studio waiting on you to come over there and play drums for him on this album. I said, nah, you guys are BSing. He said, no, nah, man. I said, okay. So I said, let me, let, me, let me tighten some things up before I go over there. Well, by my wife being, uh, in, being having a degree in, in business, she understood, and by her working with us so long in the music business, she understood what we need to do. And I also was a union musician. So we filled out the union papers before I went to the studio. And when I filled out those union papers and went to the studio, that meant that I would get union scale for whatever work that I did. Okay, and not just be going to the studio and they give me fifty dollars, <laughs> you know. So when I went over there to the studio, sure enough, BB King was sitting on the sofa and he was waiting on me, and I was like, "Whoa!" But the ambience that he had around him when you walk in there, you can feel a spiritual presence. It was entirely different. So I walked in and I played. And when I played the first song, he said, well, play the next one. I played the next one. He said, well, I want you to play on the whole album. So I played on the entire album. And this is how God worked. God set it up so that that album won a Grammy. Who would have ever believed it? But it happened. And it's, it catapulted my career I mean, so tremendously till we were able to create situations where the 1995 Super Bowl in Miami, Gwen and I, we actually did the entertainment for that Super Bowl. In 2005, and when, I, when I finally decided to come up here, we decided to split the company. So we split the company and we made EGI Records, which we had 
uh, all the way from 1980 to 2005, we had that company, and it was doing secular, and it was doing gospel, and it was doing everything. Well, we decided to do only gospel with EGI Records. And my wife, we signed a situation where she will be in control of the gospel, all the gospel. My son and I developed IMG Records, which is Infernal Music Group, and we do secular, blues, pop, rock. We, what, we go across all genres of music. What happened is by you leaving one city and coming to another one, you have to get acclimated to how the people in this city work. Well, the people in this city work uh, in a way that we wasn't used to. We were used to people in the industry really knowing the industry and knowing people who know the industry uh, make situations happen. Well, what we end up doing, we found out that majority of the things that was happening up here in Orlando was done through Universal and Disney at that time. So that meant that anything that you were trying to do pretty much on a major level had to pretty much buck those systems, and that was hard. But we ended up finding ourselves in a situation where we was able to create uh, our own ambience, and we began to grow. And finally, it took us a couple of years. We didn't just jump into it. It took us a couple of years to be able to find the right people because, I mean, so many people that we tried to deal with that they just didn't fit what we were doing. And uh, it ended up happening where, you know, I have a sin. Just because you start with somebody don't mean you're going to end with them. <laughs> so, so by me being in the music business, I understood that, and we kept moving forward. And me, I'm also wanting to help the youth, too. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to teach, willing to inspire. So God has blessed me to the point of where now I'm the chairman of Orlando Technical uh, Advisory Board, Digital you know, Music Department. I'm on the advisory board for Valencia College Music Department. I'm on the board of directors for the Florida Songwriters Association. So God is still blessing me. And just recently, I went out uh, to Los Angeles to the Grammys, and I was on a talent management panel. And that was something that was really exciting. I worked with artists like Gladys Knight and the Pips, James Brown, Al Green, the Commodores. Which artists have you enjoyed working with the most and why? The artist that I enjoyed working with the most was B.B. King. Why? Because he was so humble. He was a humble man. I, I did not, I never had worked with him before, but he was so uh, humble and, and, and he was somebody that you didn't mind being around them. And the thing is, he wasn't to the point of where he didn't want you around him because he was the man, you know. He didn't mind you being, if you the musician, he didn't mind you being around him. It's all about how he treated you, and he treated everybody, you know, I mean, he treated everybody with a great spirit. What's it like being able to help shape a young artist's career? Man, to shape a young artist's career uh, and to see them blossom into being a real great star, you can't beat the feeling if you really put your heart into grooming them. You, you really can't beat the feeling. You really have to be like, it's like your kids. They're like your kids. You, you, you bring them to the point of, hey man, they're nothing now, and all of a sudden, Everybody, you know, know who they are, and they're growing, and they're looking good, and they're sounding good. But the most important thing is that they understanding what you teaching them. And the, the most important part is that they stay humble. If they stay humble and listen to you, then when you find that kind of person that is willing to listen to you, Brother, sometimes you're telling them things that they don't like to hear, but they still listen anyway and they still follow your instructions. You cannot beat that feeling 
on how how they blossom and grow into something. You can I mean it's it's a feeling that when you're dealing with young people, uh, a lot of young people today, they think that the social media is where it's at. Well, the social media helps, but nothing beats a personal relationship with individuals in the industry. That is what make you grow. The social media, yes, it helped you for its promotions and a million people seeing and thinking that you're doing things. But until you actually hit that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person to find out exactly where they're coming from, what they're talking about, what do they mean, what are they trying to do, uh, do you have, what is your vision, what is their vision, until you actually see that, then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't equate to anything. We do a program called So You Want to Name and Lights. Uh, it was a, a vision that I had years ago, and the vision was to help the youth to establish themselves in the music industry. We, we began to do STEM, we began to do financial literacy, life skills, you know, we began to incorporate, we, uh, and we used music as a carol to draw the kids, which was bringing them to the point of learning keyboards. And then we also did something else. We also created a situation where they learned to write songs, and we had them to also uh, sing the song <laughs> that they wrote. We worked with that, and we presented that, and. And that's what we're still doing. Every summer, we're planning on having that summer camp and helping the youth because the youth are the future. And, and they are definitely the future in the music business. So we need them. But they also need to learn the business. So I make it my business to make sure that they understand how the industry works.